We have the honor and the blessing to have Mike and Karen here today, and uh, many of you know them. Uh, some of you may not. I, I first met Mike and Karen almost 40 years ago, so that kind of <laughs> dates us a little bit. Yeah. And I knew back then that they had a, a blended family. Also, Mike is a, a man who really loves the Lord, and I knew even back then that God had a special calling on his life, so it wasn't a surprise to me when I found out all the years later when we came back to ACC that, that he is, was pastoring a church of his own. So uh, anyway, I'd like to introduce Mike, and I don't know if, Karen, if you're going to speak too also. So here they are. I'm going to, you know, Gordon, this is smoother than mine on the top. <laughs> you got to paint it every now and then. You got to uh, prototype it. I'm going to move it down just for a second for Karen so uh, so we can stand around. Uh, in case you don't know me, in, in the heat, brief, we, we're, we're honored to be here and uh, we're thankful. Come on up, hon, because I won't take that long. Um, uh, so, yeah, our, ours, our, we're, we're close to 40 years in marriage this Woo! next year. So, yeah, we have uh, yeah. Wow. Four, we have four kids, hers, mine, and ours. And, uh, and then we have uh, 14 grandkids, two great-grandkids. Wow. So, you know, and the nice thing about the great-grandkids is you don't have to babysit them. You give them, you give them to your kids, you play with them, you have all the fun. And then you don't have any of the trials. You just go to your kids. And I say, payback. Here you go. <laughs> so, so it's a lot of fun. Um, but let me just give a brief thought here. Uh, I am the, we, we, you know, we, we are sent out of this church uh, 30, almost 30 years ago. Be just coming up, actually, December. Uh, kind of next, you know, 30 years ago. So we started the church. We have... Two locations, the churches are doing well. Um, we, we do things around the world as, as this church does. And uh, we've seen that grow. So ours is a, a marriage that was birthed in both love, intimacy, and ministry. So uh, within mind. So um, we'll, we'll talk about that. But uh, how much time do we have? Whatever you want to take. Well, you don't, don't say that. You know. <laughs> 45 minutes to an hour. 45, okay. And we want to have some questions. So, questions. so it's quarter after, so we got an idea. All right. Uh, let me just say this, and, and, and you're all, we're all mature enough here to understand this real simply, um, that brokenness is really the, the, that we see here. We're, we're talking about a broken world. So when we're talking about conflict, we're talking about those things. Marriage is a union made in a broken world. Through the Almighty God, and of course that's where Adam and Eve were, and of course we know that their sin caused the brokenness. And then every couple has a choice; every person has a choice, of course, to accept Christ and to receive the love, acceptance, and forgiveness that He offers, and to be restored to Him, and then align your life up with Him and your marriage up with Him, and so forth. Or you can go and remain in a brokenness. And of course, the problem is is in America, as we've seen, the, the, the absence of Christ grow in, in families. We see then byproducts of that, of course, all through the United States now, which is something that we didn't grow up always with. There was always a respect for the Bible. There was always a respect for God and so forth. Where now you have less of that just because of a lack of understanding, not a lack of desire. People are born in God's image, so that those urges are there. But we're dealing with brokenness. So when we're talking about a blended family, we're dealing with brokenness <coughs> and, and how to repair that. So it's a lot, it's, and that's really where I want to make sure we understand. So we're not coming from perfection, we're coming from a brokenness. <coughs> so um, I think that's the, the attitude that you always have to understand, that uh, people sometimes think of perfection. Or no, I say, Lord, put us together. <laughs> And that's the great manual that he's given us called the Bible to help us come together and, and to, to, even in the midst of the brokenness, be one with him and, in this case, be with each other. And there's a plate. I forget the name. You know the name of that plate that has the gold through it that's combined. Kintsuki or something. What is it? 
Kintsuki or Kintsuki Japanese. Place. It's yeah. Japanese. Well, anyway, and this is what I this I should have brought it from my my son has one, but he's he has many companies. So, what it, it, it's it's a plate that was broken, put together in pieces, and what has uh, connects it is gold, actually gold. So you can see gold running through it all the way through. And so you lift up this plate and you see a brokenness that was made together, you know, put together. And God is that goal for us. Through the Holy Spirit, he's put us together. And so that's where I want us to, to kind of understand where we're coming from on the blendedness is a brokenness that's been put together by God to walk as one. So with that said, my wonderful, gorgeous wife, uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> they, they always, people usually go, man, Pastor Ross has a young wife. <laughs> I'm so, actually older than he is. But we weren't going to say that. <laughs> I, I am 66 years old. My back is still clean, you know what I mean. <laughs> go ahead. I am 66 years old. And how many of you remember this? I was born at a very early age. <laughs> remember that? Okay, okay so... I was 19 years old, young and foolish. <laughs> I loved fairy tales and Disney princesses and Harlequin romances and soap operas. Foolish. I didn't listen to warnings from my parents. I was in love with love, like Romeo in Romeo and Juliet. I clung to the phrase, love conquers all. And so I got married in that condition, didn't listen to my dad, and I assumed that my husband thought the same way I did and felt the same way I did about things and had the same intentions that I had. Seven years and two kids later, he came home from work and said, we need to talk. And so we went and sat in our living room and he informed me, I'm in love with someone else and I want a divorce. I was in shock because I didn't have a clue I have no idea. Your turn. <laughs> well, mine, mine was, I, got, I was uh, called when I was five years old by the Lord to do what I'm doing now. But my dad was murdered when I was eight. And as a result, uh, all the stuff that the world tells you not to do, I did. Uh, my mom, I was the youngest of five. And, and through it all, uh, you know, the Lord just kept, I just kept asking God, don't forget about me. And he didn't. And then as uh, I moved out of my own when I was 15, uh, 16 years old, had a house, so forth and so on. But then God just kept drawing me to himself. And through it all, when I got saved, uh, in the sense of recommitted my life and, and really found out about him, because nobody in my family was a Christian, so I had to just kind of grow into that. <laughs> And, and when I did, I, you know, one of the things that you do is, you know, instead of being as the world tells you in, in, with people, you, you, you want to follow the Lord. So mine was marriage. And I was very committed to the Lord to the place of where uh, I just, you know, you're a Christian woman. I'm a Christian man. We can do this, you know. And, and it, it really, my, my problem was my will. My will be done versus God. That's, you know, a lot of us rebel. And, and so when I got saved, I had to learn how to really, and, and I should say maturing in him, because I, you know, it was to, to learn how to submit to him. And that was a hard thing. And so people were also warning me, don't do it so fast, you know. But I'm going, hey, I got God. Through God, all things are possible, you know, and why not? And so we did. And, and the problem was, is that her heart, was not committed in the same way mine was. And to where she, she just couldn't be with one person. And so, it, it, I mean, and I'm not saying this is a derogatory, she's healthier now in her life, she's married, but she had like 10 marriages. I mean, so she had a difficulty staying with one. And you know, that's just one of those short-sighted foolishness things that I did. And through it all, we had a daughter together um, who's, who's there. So Karen had two children. I've had one. And then through it all, of course, uh, Karen and I met, and we won't go into all that, and here's our wonderful, wonderful romance. So mm -hmm. that's kind of how my blended family came. Now, now, I did not, neither one of us did not want to be married to those people who loved us. It wasn't that hard. 
But I also understand my foolishness in it mm -hmm. and my willfulness in it. But at the same time, there wasn't a disconnect of desire. So I even submitted mine to the pastors up at Abbott Loop at the time when we were in Alaska if I could remarry. And they, they saw, they even interviewed my ex-wife and so forth. And they came to the conclusion that that would biblically be there. So my heart was always wanting to be biblical, but it wasn't always uh, felt. You have to have two. How can two walk together unless they agree? Mm -hmm. So, and of course, a lot of that is there. So today, what we're going to talk about is some things that Karen will go over with you. Okay, so today we want to talk about um, building and maintaining unity in a blended family. Because statistics show that in the United States, 50% of first marriages end in divorce. And that includes Christian marriages. Isn't that sad? 67% of second marriages end in divorce. Even Christian marriages. And 74% of third marriages end in divorce. And the percentage goes up. The, um, you add more marriages, <laughs> the percentage goes up. So second marriages have difficulty for a lot of reasons. Because once a person has gone through a divorce, they tend to think, I've been through one, I can get through another. And so they're more likely to call an attorney when they run into problems. They're also more willing, and they have the tendency to throw the divorce card into any argument. Well, I'll just go get a divorce then, because we can't possibly work this out. And so there's less of a commitment there, because they forget the trauma <laughs> of the divorce. And it is traumatic. So they tend to use the same exit strategy that they used in their, first, in their last relationship. Some people choose the wrong person or they bring the same emotional struggles or the same emotional baggage into a new relationship that they had in their previous one. And some people even go from one abusive relationship to another. They just keep following a pattern of, of making unfortunate choices. And some people enter into a marriage on the rebound. <laughs> And they go, they don't give themselves time to heal. And they don't get used to being alone and, and independent. They don't take the time to think things through. They just want to avoid being lonely. So they rush into a new relationship. Another issue is common children. Common children with their own original mom and dad, they tend to be a deterrent to divorce because, you, oh, I, we need to stay together because of the children. That doesn't always work out either, but they tend to be a deterrent. They're kind of like a little bit of glue that holds the relationship together over some struggles. In blended families, combining children creates more conflict many times, and they bring more complication. Even when you have the best of intentions, it's not easy to get along with other people's children, to even like them, let alone love them. Now, that doesn't mean that second or third marriages can't work out, but we want to point out some of these things so we're better prepared to deal with them. And you guys, like, like um, Mike said, <laughs> we have blended families here, so you know all these things. Mike and I are often shocked at how little people give thought to their ways and how they tend to not even consider God when they're entering into relationships. For me, I hated going through my divorce. It was the worst thing that could have happened to me. I hated it. I was grieved that my children were going to have to grow up without their dad. It still breaks my heart. I hated being a statistic, a failure. I was very afraid of being hurt again. So I clung to the Lord. And I was actually very willing to stay single for the rest of my life. I didn't need a man. <laughs> I thought. <laughs> I don't need no man. <laughs> but I remember being lonely. I remember 
laying in my bed at night crying and saying, Lord, can't I please just have a date? And then I'd stop myself and I'd say, oh no, oh no, back up. I want to do this your way, not my way. Because I saw the fruit of what was going my own way and not listening to my parents and not seeking the Lord. I lived through the fruit of that. So I was not willing to get out of God's will for anything. So that helped me to think things through and not by, be led by my own, my old fairy tale romantic thinking. So whenever a woman comes to me and shares that she's struggling in her marriage, the first question I ask her is, are you building or tearing down? That comes from Proverbs 14.1. A wise woman builds her house. A foolish one tears hers down with her own hands. And I can say I've seen some men tear down their house with their own hands too. So this is just not confined to women. But the scripture says, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. And so that is the essence of unity, being, becoming one. And I love how it says become one, because it's a growth thing. You grow together. And it's the heart of God for us to be unified. So how do we build and maintain unity in our marriages? Through constant communication. Constant communication. We talked so much before we got married, and we continue to talk, 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 talk. Because that helps lead us to agreement, leading to a common direction and focus. So you can have a target you're aiming at, or you can go the way of the world and just live your life randomly. So we have a target, and we're aiming at that target. We don't always hit the target. Sometimes our arrows go down to the ground. Sometimes they hit the outer ring. Sometimes they hit an inner ring. And sometimes we hit a bullseye. But we're at least heading in a direction. Matthew 19.5 said, This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. <laughs> Just so you know, too, and a lot of you probably already know this, the, the two times where people are most likely to get divorced is 10 years and 25, okay? 25 is because why? Kids are leaving. So have you built your life? See, when we got married and I had all the kids, they had four children, and I had them sitting on the couch and I, and I came like this and they were sitting there and I said, and they were just, you know, pretty young, and I said, never try to come between here. And you know what they did? They, they start crying and bitter. No, they start laughing. They said, good. Kids love to see the unity because right, it builds in them see. security right. and long term. They need to know that you don't come between mom and dad. Don't, don't try to, if, if she, they tried to come and do her and then do me, that, that didn't work because we would not allow it. So once again, you got to operate and function as one. Now, there's another understanding of this when, oh, there, there it went, okay, right. somehow. Uh, when God brought Karen and I together, we... We both had our own individual relationship with Jesus. I, I'm amazed at how many people think one of the things that you think sometimes, which is improper, is weak. I, they're weak. I can help them become strong. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, I know women never think that way. Uh, 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 you, know, uh, you know, they never think that way. Guys just, you know, I uh, get the prize. Wow, it's beautiful. You know, so, so God, if you can just picture this, this triangle, and you might have seen it already, you have... God here at the top, and you have, I think you have, do you have it on your notes? Yeah, then you have husband and wife. What happens when the individuals grow toward God? They grow toward each other, don't they? And, and that's where the, you know, the Bible says, you know, be one in heart, mind, and purpose with God and each other. And so we talk a lot about things because we want to make sure that you just don't assume right. that happens. You know, we were committed to living our lives in ways that were pleasing to God. So that because of that, our relationship with God, we were intentional. You know, we were intentional in everything we do. We talk about it. You know, I, I guarantee you, if you're not intentional, you'll find out somebody else will be for you. Mm -hmm. Somebody else will be intentional for you. So we deliberately chose to grow. We deliberately chose to change. We adapted to please God and each other. We didn't settle for the status quo in our life or in our marriage. 
Now, let me explain why we're meeting here. And I talked to Kirk about this on the phone in the sense of this. Why do we meet? Why is this meeting really here? Is it for better marriage or to glorify God? It's really for glorify God. Because if you glorify God, you'll have a great marriage. Amen. It's to really help you to go out and be witnesses for Christ. It's really to help you to go out and, and see the darkness over you. It's to build a church and reach the law. It's not about better marriages. It's about us functioning within the capacity that God calls us to do. And as we do, he goes, if you focus on him, you know, Matthew 6.33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, guess what? Everything else is going to work, even though he's talking about it in the context of supply. But it's the same way with everything else. So if you make that your goal is God's glory and for everything he's called us to, your marriage is just a, quote, and I'm going to say this word, institution to help carry that out. Does that make sense? Sure. The problem is a lot of times we try to draw marriage away like it's separate, yeah. like family, like they're trying to do, by the way, in the United States, right. is trying to keep it a separate entity, which it's not. It's called by God. It's a, it's a marriage is made by God, not by me. And so we've got to understand that it has to be consistent also. You know, once we learn new principle, we work it and practice it together. We, we talk about it. How can we make it better? By the way, if most companies understand this, how do you create excellence in your company? By doing what you do with, with less mistakes. <laughs> with less mistakes. Okay? That's where you get excellence. You don't get 50 things. You get about two or three, four things, whatever it is. And then you just work at it to where it's that way. We want excellence in our marriage. So let's look at the mistakes that we have done in the past. And we, we examine that. Also, we're growing together. We, we have the... Like I said, the triangle is the man and the woman. We grow together. We are intentional about growth. We're intentional about being consistent. We're also intentional about this. We never, 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 never give up. I'm telling you, you can't give up. I am, I'm just not a give I'm a Browns fan. I mean, you know, what can I say? You just never give up. Stupid or whatever, you know, you don't give up. You have hope. I believe they're going to beat the Patriots tomorrow at 425. You know what I'm saying? They're just waiting to unleash. That's all. Now, you just can't give up. The Bible says this in Galatians 6, 9, and 10. It says, we'll reap a harvest if we don't give up. Yeah. A lot of people, unfortunately, we have some people we're dealing with right now in our church, that they're, they're, they're in that spot where, they, where you hit the bottom, okay? That's not the time to give up. That's right. the time to go up and get, get up and go up. See, and, and the problem is when we get no hope. Mm -hmm. See, with faith, you can have a lot of people have faith, but they have no hope. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. God, it says when it's dark, it's what? Dawn right before the dark, you know, it's darkest, darkest before right the before the dawn. And that's the whole thing about revelation coming. If we don't give up, God will bring hope, insight, revelation to your, to your individual life as well as whatever you're involved with, how to work it out. So we talk a lot, as we said. We decided before we got married that we're going to live by faith. You know, we, we, we uh, on our wedding night, we knelt before the bed and just said, Lord, we dedicate this marriage to you before anything you know, we just do that. And, and that's the intent that you have to have. You can never give that up. You've got to keep your eye on the prize all the time. My prize it, it, with her and I was to glorify God and to, to make disciples who go and live in love like Jesus. That's our children. You know, whether my children ever talk to me again, if they're out there living for Jesus, then that's my reward. Now, we have cell phones now, so we know that can happen <laughs> and, and everything. But see, that's, that's our reward, isn't it? But I get to love them all the time. So Karen and I decide we're going to follow the guidance of the Word of God and the Spirit of God. That's, that's very important. If you aren't reading your Bible, who's guiding you? I mean, who is? If you're not a, a committed to your Bible on a daily basis, if you're not, you know, every morning I get up and I say, Holy Spirit, lead me this day. Mm -hmm. Lead me, fill me, and lead me this day. You know, because I need to have him in my life doing that. He wants us to invite him in. So in your marriage, it's really getting down to that principle. So the commitment was there, but we still had a lot to learn and a lot of maturing to do. How many of you have, still have to mature? I'm only 63. 
So I, I'm just, and I'm just, by the way, I'm just getting going. There's no, I, 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 I'm just really getting going. Now I say that to you without, without God gave me a vision when, 58 years ago that I'm still working toward. It's not complete yet. We're just starting to see some un, things unfold even more. Why, you know, the problem with America, and I'm just going to add this in a little extra. They got us thinking, not kingdom, but our kingdom. Retirement became, instead of retreading your tires and doing something for the kingdom in a different way, it got to be going off to the side and living for yourself mm. and your kids, your family. Okay? I don't live for my family. I don't live for my wife. I don't live for you. I live for him. And I get to love and please you. I get to love and serve you, I should say, while I get to love and serve him, or please him. I get to love and please the Lord while I get to love and serve you. But I don't live for you. I live for him. Right. So he says, as long as I have breath, what? Praise the Lord. So the marriage, we should come into your marriage and find at the center the living God who passes all understanding. In the of your and every hope you have should be connected to him. Every purpose you have should be connected to him. If you want to see a lasting, fulfilling marriage in the way that God intended. Otherwise, we lower the standard and we begin to live in, as an institution designed by man and the world more than by God. You understand that? So that's where we, we really see. So, Karen Ross. Okay. So, you know, and I wouldn't want it any other way. I don't want him living for me. <laughs> no way, man. I do not. <laughs> I want him. That's where our safety is. That's where our blessing comes from, is because we're living for the Lord, not for each other. And Ephesians says to make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. <laughs> it takes effort, and it takes a lot of effort. It doesn't happen naturally. If we just let ourselves be our natural selves, we're going to go down the tubes very quickly. And you can't give up, because if you do, you'll fail. And we see it everywhere. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, he says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions. It's talking about the church here, but you can, this speaks of marriage too. Let there be no division. United in thought and purpose. So we want to live in harmony with no division. And this should start before the marriage takes place and continue after the wedding takes place. And for the rest of our lives, we're going to be make, trying to make every effort to live in unity. But if, if people get married before they even consider these things, it's not too late. We can always start at any moment to build unity. You can't undo what's been done, but you can start brand new every day, new like the do. Yeah, I think this is where I talk a little bit about uh, <laughs> Ephesians 5.22. It says the man considers the wife and... The wife yields to the husband. By the way, yielding, submitting is a tremendous word. You know, quit this stuff and don't let people around you. You know, I've done this with a lot of young people and I've changed their hearts because I've said, no, submission is a great word. Yeah, I had a problem when I was young. I didn't know it's, in fact, I was a rebel with a cause, my own. And, and I tell people, you know, don't ever tell you, that, you know, people always have rebel with their own purpose in mind. But submission is a wonderful word. But we've allowed the liberal mentality come in and try to separate. And by the way, behind that is Satan himself. Yes. He wants to separate us from our submission to God. He wants to separate us from our consideration of him. So how does the? and I want to give you a, a, just a quick illustration of how the spirit and the word work. Okay, together. So how does the spirit of the word and the word work together? It is the spirit of God that makes the Bible meaningful. Who authored it? The spirit. And then it is the Bible that makes the spirit understandable. So it's the spirit of God that makes the Bible meaningful. Without, that's why without the spirit of God, the Bible is, is a good book, but it's a bunch of stories. It doesn't connect. But if you have the spirit of God, all of a sudden it becomes what? Meaningful. And then the Bible helps us understand how the spirit moves. And so we have an understanding of that. 
So if you're not led by the Spirit, the Bible says, you're not children of God. So I, I don't know about you, I want to read that so I can understand how to be led by the Spirit. And then I'm led by the Spirit, in turn, He's going to help me to understand the Word of God and make it meaningful in my life. So we need to be understanding. That's the way her and I work. We're, we're one. We work together that way. She, she has great gifts, great abilities that complement me and so forth and so on. But she also, we, we pursue the word of God. You know, we pursue what the word tells us. She's led by the spirit. And I must, my goal in my life, and I have it written down, is to help her reach her maximum potential in Christ. It's not to do what I will, even though that would be convenient at times. <laughs> but we know that's not the truth. <laughs> no, it's help her to reach her maximum potential. That, that's my goal. If I'm not doing that, when, when, then what am I treating her like? See, she's a gift from God. She's a treasure from the Lord. You know, she's, she's a wonderful person. And when I have a discussion or a harsh word, I go to the Lord and I ask him to forgive me for treating her, his gift to me that way. Please help me to get better. So we must understand that marriages work this way. Now, the thing about blended marriages is that you'll probably carry some baggage in with you into the new marriage. You might not even be aware that you're doing this. And often it, it, it fails because we, we make vows that before. She had a vow before. I, when I was eight years old, my dad was murdered. I said, I'll never allow this incident to, to determine who I am. The problem with that, you get gabados, thick-headed about a lot of things. Okay? She had her own statements about that. And you bring those into your marriages. Yeah. And sometimes you, they create a war zone instead of a peace zone. Yes. And so you got to learn how to work those through and surrender them to God. And those things have to be talked out. We were talking about those things even today. Mm -hmm. uh, how I struggle, you know, in my life because of uh, ever since I was little. And she never knew this because I don't allow it to control me. But I've battled depression a lot. But now she never sees it because the word of God has come into my life. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit's leading me. But it doesn't mean I'm not tempted. Right. But she didn't know that. So we were talking about that on the way up. And in our culture, we're all about demanding our own rights and spouses and spouting our opinions. And sometimes we do that without considering the other person. The Bible says what? Love doesn't demand its own way, doesn't demand its own opinion, you know? But yet we come in and, you know, we gotta have our own way. And we gotta, yet, you know, I gotta consider her. The number one thing, guys, the Bible tells you, consider her, just like Jesus considered us. And so, and hers is to yield unto me, the father, quote, the husband, as Jesus submitted to his father. The example's there. Mm -hmm. So we see that. So, uh, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> now, let's look at some most common trouble areas that we have in blended family. We're just going to go through these really quickly, but I want to mention that my vow after I went through my divorce was, no one will ever treat me that way again. And so I brought that baggage into our marriage. Mm -hmm. And so I would assume that he was against me because my first husband beat me, he hit me. And I, he, he pushed me down and that was never his motivation. But I would assume things about him because of that vow I had made. And it was, it, yeah. I had well, to learn. You are stand up on that thing. One time. Go oh, ahead. please don't Think tell the story. It. She was up on a higher chair because I'm taller than her. And one day she came up, she got, up, she got up on the chair and she said, you want to mess with me, big boy? <laughs> because because she wasn't going to allow that. And I said, I'm not him. Right. Sometimes you have to, and, and she had to remind me who, who she's not. Right, right. You know, so we got to correct each other. You know? But it was so funny standing here up there. <laughs> Go ahead. That's terrible. You. Anyway, so you see, we're not perfect, have not, but we're, we're growing and learning still to this day. And we had to learn how to communicate with one another. We're talking about communication. We had to learn how to disagree respectfully. <laughs> and we're still learning that, actually, because yeah. we are very passionate people. Absolutely. So we don't, we actually, we're both choleric, so we're, we think alike which is very fortunate. So we don't argue very often, but when we do, it's big, bad, and ugly because we're very passionate. 
And, and, and so one night, <laughs> gosh, yeah, stubborn. So one night we're having this big, huge argument. It's escalating. You know how it is. It escalates. You get on what Egerix calls the crazy cycle, and you're not even thinking rationally because you're so emotionally upset and you're, you're in each other's face and yelling at each other and screaming at each other. And right in the middle of that, oh, my flesh was like that. And the Holy Spirit speaks to me. He said, a soft answer turns away wrath. <laughs> so I, there in that moment, I had a choice to make. I could listen to the Holy Spirit and submit myself to God, or I could continue to rip his face off. <laughs> I have five new faces. (laughs) They're all in a drawer at home, yeah. So you see what I mean? He talked about the Word of God and the Spirit of God. We need to be people who follow the leading of the Spirit. And it's not always our convenience. It's not even always our desire. Because in that moment, you know how I knew it was the Holy Spirit? Because that was not me. wasn't her thought. No, not at all. So we're asking questions at the end of each one of these categories. So about communication, are you working together to respect and love one another? Are we a safe person for our spouse to be vulnerable with and transparent with? Are you intentional intentional about improving your communication skills? Are you improving in relating to your own spouse? Because what might work for Kirk and Ruth Martin may not work for Karen and Mike Ross. Because we're not cookie cutter individuals and we don't have cookie cutter couples either. So we have, the Bible talks about a woman adapting to her own husband. I don't adapt to Kirk Martin, I adapt to Mike Ross. Ruth adapts to Kirk, got it? So yes, there are some variables that are the same, but we're different people and we make, di- make up different couples. Are you being consistent in following through to forgiveness? How well do you recover after a disagreement? Are you so frustrated that you've given up? And are you building or tearing down? This, uh, okay. This is you, baby. <laughs> See, the Bible, here, here's the next part with finances. What the Bible says this, where your money is, your heart is. Now, let me explain why this is a problem in marriages, especially blended, because they have such a distrust of the past that, that people want to have two separate accounts. Yeah. We, we, that's, that's really, that's just, you're never coming together because your heart is never trusting them. Right. We we could have had that, you know, and but we we just how can you be one if you're operating like two, you know? And you got to really think that through. And a lot of times people have accounts for a reason. They're doing things that you know. How, I know people that don't even know the other person's money, and and they're really just two two people, not quite calling it marriage, but really because where your money is, what your heart is. And, and they're not considering. I know they'll say, I'll take care of this bill, but the rest is mine. And I'm going, how does that build together? Right. So we really got to think that through. So, and perhaps this is why so many couples have, finances are a terrible thing in the United States today. Mm-hmm. I've done financial counseling for years, and, and it's amazing how you can bring them together, and all of a sudden they work as one. Two are better than one, a three-fold mm-hmm. cord. And, and the multiplication, the compound effect happens. God blesses it then too. There's a lot of people who struggle in finances because they're still selfish. They're still me oriented when they get married. Before you get married or after you, if you have that and you want to see it change, get together and say we're done with that mm-hmm. and start over again. Mm-hmm. You can do it today. Now, here's the question. Are you working together as one? Or are, you, are you separate? And finances is one of the major reasons people get divorced. Yep. They can't share. I don't even see my paycheck. <laughs> and I'm her boss. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't care. Because we've agreed. We came together. 
we agreed on the, the distribution of it. We have a budget. We do all those things. And, but that's because of her gifting with computers and so forth. I just let her do all that. And she gives me my allowance. <laughs> okay? Yeah, we have that. we've that. agreed to. <laughs> yeah. Now, are you, be, are you intentional in handling? If we have over a certain amount together, we talk to each other about it. You know, so, you know, it's not like she, she doesn't need to, you know, ask me for everything, but there's certain things, or me to her, but there's certain things we do, okay? Uh, are you growing together, learning how to better handle your finances? Are you looking for ways to improve what you're doing? And are you so frustrated that you've given up, once again, on your finances? She, she just never does what I want, or he doesn't, you know, he's, he's wild in his spending. I know a lot of people are wild in their spending. Mm -hmm. Because why? They're not considerate in their spending. Mm -hmm. They're not like considered one of another person. The Bible says consider others better than yourself. You consider yourself. But, you know, one time we were, I, I was, uh, well, I won't go there because of time. Well, I was, I was, we were looking for some new furniture. And I, we got some money. And uh, so I told her, you should, I called her and I said, you shouldn't have let me come here. And I bought this, I bought these furniture without talking to her. <laughs> Needless to say, a soft answer turns away wrath. <laughs> Needless to say, you know, she, she accepted, she miserably accepted. I know I'm saying that, but it wasn't for her. Now, you know, you learn, okay, but, but you got to consider each other. There's more to it, you know. In, in that way. So, so that became a sore spot because I had to look at that furniture for years and I, I hated it. It was the ugliest. <laughs> it was, the, to me, it was the ugliest stuff I ever it saw. It was the anyway. most beautiful furniture for no. a guy who wanted to watch sports. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, how many of you know me well enough that I could care less about sports? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now we're going to talk about children because this is such a big area, especially in a blended family. I mean, this is an issue in a regular family too, because often husbands and wives disagree about handling children. But in a blended family, this gets very sticky. And it's really a shame, because ideally, you wouldn't marry a person you couldn't trust with your children, or someone you couldn't be unified with in training them. Unfortunately, not all couples think these things through before they marry. Instead, they don't face it until they reach some kind of crisis. So I want to ask you, have you discussed how to raise your children together? Are you in agreement? Or grandchildren. And how are you going to handle your grandchildren? Absolutely. Absolutely. Are you intentional to be pleasing to God and each other in the handling of your blended family children? Are you being consistent in following through with what the Word of God says and how the Holy Spirit leads you and following through on your agreed-upon plan for training children? Are you growing together, learning new and better skills about parenting? Or are you so frustrated that you've given up? And are you building or tearing down? This is about, this is about intimacy. Um, sex and romance. She'll tell you that I'm the romantic. Yes. Why? Because it's my desire to love her as Christ loved the church. God is very romantic with us. I don't know if you know that. He really is. He's very tender. He's very kind. He's very thoughtful. He's considerate. He gives you those special gifts. He's, he woos us. Mm -hmm. He woos us to himself. And uh, all I really want to say is that when we can be so selfish when it comes to sex and romance because we can be inconsiderate and demanding and manipulative. And I'm talking to both men and women here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, here's the thing that I'll, I'll give you a quick, and it's on your sheet. You, have, you see the one where it's body, soul, and spirit on the bottom? And then you have another one that says spirit, soul, and body. Now, which do you think is the Christian version? One with the simmies and one with the spirit of the bottom, I'm not sure. How you... Yeah, that's right. It is. The world functions body, soul, and spirit. Okay? It's more about body. I want to be joined to you. Especially, this is how you teach people how to go get married, by the way. And how to reconsider their marriage that they're in. Because a lot of people were trained, you know, get together, body, 
you know, we like them, you know, then six months later you hate them, you know, <laughs> because why? You've never developed a relationship, you've just, you know, sw you know swaps, you know, uh, liquids, you know, as they say, and I, I mean that, and I'm, I'm being a little gross because it needs to be gross, it needs to be understand what, that's all it is. Right. Okay. And, and because they're so lustful, because why? Out of ourselves, it comes lusts. Lusts don't care. Right. Lust wants what it wants when it wants it. That's why 70, what is it? 74, 75% of marriages fail who've had intimacy before they got married. It's automatic because there's no respect. It, it's already lowered the standard. Yeah. And unfortunately, you know, we got to be standard bearers. So, so they do body, soul. They get together and they talk about things. But they never get to the spirit a lot of times because they, they, you know, it's such conflict in the soul. Where Christians, when we get together, it should be spirit. Are we one? First of all, do we agree that, you know, she's not Islam and neither am I? Okay, we're both Christians. Okay, so we, we find out that first. Then we figure out whether we like each other. It takes a while to find out whether you like each other. Right. You, you, you do understand that. And I mean, even after you've been married a long time, we don't take each other for granted. You keep it alive. You keep it fresh. And then you enjoy each other yeah. in the physical. Okay? It crowns it. And yeah. Now, God never made it to be the first thing. He made it to be the crown of the last thing, to, it, to have enjoyment. Okay? So when people get together, they need to make sure first, are, are we spiritually connected? Now, if you've been in, Rome, in married for a long time, you want to freshen up your things, start, guys, let me tell you, start talking to your... Wife about the Lord. Amen. Engage and, and the wives start talking. Get in the Lord first. Yes. And then talk about things that you like. You know what she likes and what she doesn't like. Okay? Start doing things. Do the little things. I will, when she's, when I'm done in the bathroom, I wipe it down. I pick up everything. Okay? Because that bothered her at one time, years ago. Whatever she says, little things make the big difference. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I romance her all the time without saying a word. But then I get to say words. I get to tell her how beautiful she is, how wonderful she is, how gorgeous she is. So, and, and then, you know, if it, if it occurs, we, we have intimacy in the, in, the, in the body. But you gotta woo your wife like the Lord woos us. You gotta woo your husband like the, you know, don't do it because, you know, for some object other than, I'm gonna love them, I'm gonna honor them, I'm gonna appreciate them. But the world does it upside down. It yes. should be spirit. Then you get to know them. By the way, people will find out. Her and I, I never kissed her until I asked her to marry me. We never touched her. In fact, one time we're in this group, and I was going to touch her from behind, and the Lord said, told me, don't do that. I mean, we're not, I was just going to tap her and say, hey, because there was so much noise. The Lord told me, later on she told me, if you would have touched me, because of what happened to her before, she would have ran from me. Never knew that. So, you know, it's, it's romantic. You've got to woo each other. And that's blended family or anybody. But, uh, so are you being intentional to pleasing God and each other in your intimate life? Are you being consistent and following through to be pleasing to one another? Are you growing together, learning new, better skills as a partner? I mean, we're only in our 60s. <laughs> Let's grow. Yes, amen. Okay, are you frustrated that you've given up? Have you given up? You know, things happen to us physically, I understand that. We, we've got to learn to overcome those things, if there, there is a problem. Be creative with each other. Amen? And then, are you building or tearing down? But every marriage also displays a testimony. And I want to quickly come to a conclusion here, because our time is starting to run out. But John 17, 23 says, I'm in them, and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Families are a testimony of God and his church. Christian families. See, families are not separate from the church. They're, they're, they are what makes up the church. The church covers families and, protect, and should be watching over and nurturing and be sure a nurturing place for families to grow and, and to become their best while the church at the same time, but the world is watching both. We're a testimony. And unfortunately, sometimes we've taken out the personality of the world instead of the personality of Christ. And as a result, we have not always given the best situation. 
So with that said, I'm going to let Karen close, and then I'll have a couple of final words. If we have any questions, we can go there. So perhaps you're sitting here today, and you may realize that there's a lack of unity in your marriage. Well, do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Pursue your own growth. Because you know what happens in a situation like this is we hear things, and we may even agree with them and think they're wonderful, but we don't follow through. In a few days, what we hear here is going to start fading from our mind and our heart. And if we don't take immediate action on what the Holy Spirit is leading us to do, it's going to fade. So don't let yourself settle for the status quo. Be intentional about growing and improving. And don't hesitate to seek and gain more insight. And you can't learn these things just in your head. You have to put them into practice. If you need help, do not wait. Go talk to your pastor. Here he is. I know this man. I know this woman. I was under their leadership for over 10 years. These people care. They love you. So go talk to them. Go talk to them. Don't let pride stand in your way. Just tell them, I'd like to get together to talk about how I can grow and improve or whatever. Just, just be real. Be transparent. It would be great if you and your spouse could agree together to do this. But even if you can't come to that agreement, go yourself. If you know you need to grow, get help. Read a book. Find out how to grow in that area. Don't wait for your spouse to change. You determine to grow. There's books you can read. We have some listed there. Classes you can take. Video series to see. Wise counselors to pursue. But you can have a strong, vibrant, exciting, impactful, and even fun marriage. Let me tell you something. One time Mike and I were at a Bible study. This is when we first started the church down in East Liverpool. We were in Timmy Lynette's living room. <laughs> I was going to do something. Gonna kiss your hand or something. Um. Yeah, that was, was going to happen, but no, not now. <laughs> but I just happened to mention, I said, Mike's fun to be married to. And this man looked at me like... I was from outer space. He said, I've never heard a woman say that about her husband. And I don't know, it must have been the Holy Spirit leading me, but I said to him, are you fun to be married to? Are you what? Are fun, you fun to be married to? to, be married to. And he said, I never thought about that. <laughs> yeah. Amen. You know, so what did we talk about? We talked about how to maintain unity in a blended family, but really the family in general. So we've no. talked about you know, are you intentional? Are you consistent? You know, you've got to ask these questions. This is the only way to build. Are you building? Are you working together? Are you working as one? And are you never giving up? Now, let me just give you this thought, and then we'll have questions. Oh, and, and, and this idea. What do you think is going to happen if Christians begin to work their marriage, allow the Holy Spirit to do it, and to become the example that he's always intended, not yeah. only here, but in the community around us. How do you think it's going to improve your own life? Yeah. How do you think it's going to impact these young couples who are looking for examples that they're not able to find? They've been told marriage is a throwaway thing, yeah. when it really isn't. See, God eternal has put this in our hearts. You see, it's, when they're born, marriage is a hunger. To be together with somebody is a hunger, because that's God made us that. But we have to put it on display. We have to put it on display for them to see. So what do you think could happen? Think about that. Do you think we'd raise the water level of our city for, for the kingdom of God or lower it by doing that? What do you think? What do you think? Raise it. I mean, see, it's really a decision that we have to make ourselves. How do you think the church will grow stronger as couples grow stronger? As marriages grow stronger? <laughs> How do you think kids will be raised up? Yeah. How do you think the... See, three things that we always emphasize. That we can be an inspiration. That means as you live your life for Christ, you inspire people. I have people at bowling alleys, wherever I'm at, they say, you know, you're different. I thank God that they see that. And it's for good, usually, what they say. <laughs> I influence. I use my gift, talents, and abilities. I use everything I have to come alongside of them and help them become who they can be, whether they're saved or not. I come alongside. And then I impact. That's organized effort. 
Marriage is an organized effort given by God as a blessing to the church and to the community if we really allow it to glorify Him so that we can see, we, so we can make it hard for people to go to hell in this place. Amen. How many of you want to make it hard for people to go to hell? Amen. And go live a life for Christ. They're going to watch you. They're going to see you. It might be 10 years later, they'll go, man, I, I, you guys impacted me. Yeah. How many times have you had people say that to you? You never even know they were looking at you. <laughs> but see, people are always watching you. See, we know, we, President Trump is not the answer. Okay, President Obama wasn't the answer. Uh, a philosophy is not the answer. Christ is the answer. Yes. Christ in us is the answer. We're the hope for mankind through Jesus Christ. Amen? We offer it to them. So, okay? Anybody have any questions? Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things that you said, that you both said, that I think is very impactful is that we cannot change our spouse. That's right. We can only change us. Yeah. But so often when we change us, mm -hmm. we see our spouse change. That's right. And I, you know, that's a principle in my own life that I've seen happen. And I know Gloria has. And I think it's really a powerful thing that when we can do that, mm -hmm. uh, again, it's, it's the triangle principle that you yeah. at the beginning. The closer Absolutely. you get to the Lord, the closer right. you get together. Yeah. And uh, so I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And remember, it's not even you that changes. You're submitting to the King of Kings. It's by where it says in what Second Corinthians three, it tells us we're changed from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So you can have intention to desire change, but you want to be like. See, Christ is you know is our destiny is to be like Christ. Our, our destination is before the Father. See, he's, Jesus is always taking us to the Father. Amen? But he's, while, while we're being transformed in the likeness of Christ. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. So that, that's, a, that's true. What, any other questions? Thoughts? Just a, just a thought of, you know, this happened with Mike and I. Um, when we went through, uh, we went through a horrible hell in our marriage. Mm -hmm. But when we both decided we were coming back to God and we devoted our time to get closer to God, mm -hmm. we had three adult children. Our youngest mm -hmm. was just graduating from high school at the time. Mm -hmm. If we had not have done what we did and commit our lives to God and our mm -hmm. marriage to God, right. I don't know where our children would be right now. That's but right. because of they saw the unity that Mike and I went through right. and learning to be who God wanted us right. to be. Right. All three of our children and their families are serving God today. Amen. And that, that in itself is a miracle because right. of where our marriage was 24 to 25 Amen. years ago. Exactly. And the thing about it is, is, is that now that they're adults, like, right. and, and this is one of the things that's so interesting about hearing about blended families is my daughter is part of a blended family. Mm -hmm. and. I was wondering, maybe you guys could give us insight on how it, how the interaction between yeah the others the others. I was just going to talk about that real quick. Do you want to say anything yeah, first? Yeah, I want to mention one other thing that I didn't yeah. answer before because something you said sparked it. One of the things that Mike and I did together that's kind of weird is we would have these, like I said, not very often, but when we argued, it was big bad and ugly. And after every argument. After we had come together and forgiven one another, da, da 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 da, we would make plans for our next argument. Right. We would say, okay, next time we get into an argument, you're going to sit in this chair, and I'm going to sit in this yeah, chair. We aren't going to get out and walk around. We're not going to pace. We're not going to stomp our feet and blah, 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 you know that kind of thing. We are going to control ourselves. <laughs> we're going to sit and we're going to try to be rational human beings. Yeah. And so. That really helps. Yeah, well, it does. arguments went from this space of time yeah. to where we can, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. But to talk about the children, yeah. um, forget about it. Forget about it. <laughs> yeah. um, There's two major things with the children. I, I've got to say, from my own personal <coughs> yeah. experience, when, when, we, when she came to live with us, that's my daughter. When she came to live with us, she was this beautiful little waist like girl who was very shy and. Remember, <laughs> she was just such a little sweetie. It was kind of easy for me to love her, but not always. I had to decide to love her. I had to make a choice to love her. I had to intentionally decide 
I am not going to treat her any different than I do my own blood-related children. And we've kind of, we, that's an agreement we've had, like, started from the very beginning with his mother, who, as soon as she found out we were getting married, and she had never met my children before, but we went to her house, and you know what she said to them? I'm going to be your new grandma. Yeah. She never treated them any yeah. differently than yeah. her own blood-related yeah. grandchildren. Right. And we just, no. both of us. I never have used family. the term stepchildren. Right. I don't believe in it because they became my children. Right. I mean, and that's the thing. It, it wasn't her. We, I use hers, mine, and ours only for this definition. But we're, we're a family. Yes. Uh, and, and to the place of where, it, even with the exes, we never talk bad about the exes ever to, it, to them at all. Uh, these are commitments we've made. Uh, we, we t in fact, we ensure them to honor them. When they come back from their visits and they got the attitude change, I, give them about, I gave them about eh, a couple hours and I said, okay, now you're home. The rules are the same. You know, get it right. And they would do that. They would train them how to be godly. That's what the Bible says. So, and, and so we had to train them how to even interact. Because my, my one son came back. He came back one time and he said to me, Dad, he, he'll, he'll, he might be my dad, but you'll always be my example. So you have to understand the responsibility that you have it is to help them through life, even though they, they love these people. They are, they, they are their parents, and they began to take on their characteristics. It's just, it's just the way it goes, and you have to battle that in prayer and example, and sometimes they go that way, sometimes they don't. But you've got to understand that's not your responsibility to change them. Yours is to train them in the way they should go and give them a path for them to do so that they can come back to it over and over and over again. My kids, my, our youngest now is like 37? He was born in 78. Yeah, so how old is he? You know, so <laughs> the point of it is, you know, so, but he has multiple businesses, but he, he only knows us. And the relationship is different because he has us, whereas the others have different people. And you have to deal with all that. But your way of dealing it is you live as God called you. You glorify God now that you do. And, and don't worry about all that stuff. You pray about it. Don't get me wrong. And you, and you consider it. But don't make it your passion to, quote, save your kids. God's the Savior. Right. We're the example. We're the, we're the committer of the word. We're the, we're the example of the word. Amen? Amen. And so when they, they have questions, answer them accordingly. You know, I'll just give you this one real quick. My one son, when he was out, he kind of started, you know how they get to that age where they complain about me. But they complained about her, not me. I was sitting there on the phone. I'm going, oh, you just hey. don't know. Well, I don't care. I, I, I really don't care. I really don't care. But anyway, I'm sitting there on the phone, and, and they started talking about her. I started laughing. I mean, the, I go, you're complaining about the woman who took your diapers off you, fed you, nurtured you, cared for you all this time, and you're starting to speak, you know, and, and about, I don't know, not much longer, they call this apologize to her. Sometimes you have to bring them back to some sense. But they're still, they're following your example. Okay? And I always look at that uh, and, and stuff. So it doesn't, that's blended families. Are, they do add a bunch more pressure than the northern, because you're dealing with now opinions and, and habits and everything that are separate. I mean, you just do. And it's reality that we face. But you can walk through it with the strength of Christ and so forth and so on. Okay? That's great. Amen. Very good. Yeah. Okay. That's it.